Garden of Van Van is one of the most controversial mascot horror franchises currently on the market. These games have attracted negative attention for various reasons, from game quality to the developers behind the project. But with Garden of Van Van 7 now released, I want to answer the question everyone is thinking about. Will Garden of Van Van ever recover from the controversy and become the gaming giant we all know it can be? To answer that question, let's map out the hurdles Garden of Van Van has to beat. The first is game quality. There is a noticeable difference when you compare the gameplay of a Garden of Van Van game to a Poppy Playtime or Bendy. Van Van is lower in quality in nearly every single category. The characters look funky, the buildings look funky, the story barely makes sense, and the voice acting is interesting to be kind. These are all critiques that have been around since the beginning of Ban Ban. Even looking back at chapter 1 when the game was free, people still complained about this game and franchise trying to milk more money from the mascot horror genre. Now, to be fair to the developers, they weren't done any favors from other mascot horror franchises. Poppy Playtime had released their controversial NFTs paywalling the game's lore, Rainbow Friends was essentially Poppy Playtime in Roblox, and Hello Neighbor had released the nasty fart that was Hello Neighbor 2. So when Ban Ban arrived on the scene, people were not in a receptive mood. Many prominent voices on the internet started to dig at this game for its poor choices and how the developers implemented horror, the drone mechanics, pre-made stock assets, and the general pathing of the game. The Euphoric brothers who made Garden of Ban Ban were catching heat from everywhere. The main issue with all the criticism aimed towards Garden of Ban Ban 1 is that it was free. You had to pay nothing to play this game. Yes, a merch shop was available from day one which is an entirely separate topic, but anyone with a PC and a Steam account could experience the game. The only thing that mattered was if the Euphoric Brothers continued to make Garden of Ban Ban games and ever charged for them, did the quality improve? Well, the Euphoric Brothers are releasing the Garden of Ban Ban games at a rate faster than the speed of sound, so with Garden of Ban Ban 7 out, we have a lot to examine. The second Ban Ban game came with a price tag of $5 USD and many improvements from the first. The overall size of the game was much larger, there was voice acting, and we met new characters. However, with the these new improvements, there was criticism of their execution. An example is how the game used puzzles. The drone from the first chapter is back and plays a large role in the player's progression. Unfortunately, the drone was still extremely difficult for the player to use. Just getting the little guy from point A to point B was a nuisance and made the game longer than it should be. Another thing that made the game take longer to complete was the confusing and long-winded puzzles. The first puzzle you encounter requires using a color-coded system to check in different employees. Now, I had some issues with this puzzle and I wasn't the only one. Things got even more tedious with this fake classroom segment where you had to answer an annoying amount of elementary school level questions and settle some class recess beef. Another annoying challenge was the beach cannon area where you had to shoot fireworks at different glowing buttons, which also went on for too long. But some of you may be asking, what the problem is with this? Well, Garden of Ban Ban 2 and the future games have a price tag. This game cost $4.99 before taxes, so some believe that the Euphoric Brothers purposely made the puzzles and challenges tedious to extend the game's runtime. The reason for this is that Steam allows you to return a game if you don't like it, and to return it, you can't have played the game for more than two hours. Some content creators even livestreamed the game and joked about trying to beat the game in under two hours so they can refund it. In summary, Garden of Ban Ban 2 didn't do much to restore the reputation of the Ban Ban franchise. People continued to call it a lazy attempt at making money. But now that Garden of Ban Ban 7 is out, I want to take these criticisms of Garden of Ban Ban 2 and apply them to the latest release. This could be a good way of seeing if the Euphoric Brothers have improved or taken some of this criticism to heart. The first area we'll inspect for any improvement is our little buddy, the drone. This little guy played a massive role in the second game, but how was he used in the seventh? Within the first few seconds, you must use him to hit a few buttons. The next time we see him, he's getting a massive upgrade. The player can now control him remotely like a high-tech drone. At one point, you need to break the glass of a window to let yourself into a building. This is a massive improvement from the previous Ban Ban games. We can do it ourselves instead of waving our remote around and smashing our heads against the screen, hoping the drone hits a button at the right angle. The next and most intriguing drone usage comes toward the end of the game. Here, the player uses the drone to access a map of buttons. The lit buttons we see with the drone are the ones the player needs to jump on to progress. This is where I have to give the developers praise, a smart way of updating the drone with a new feature that makes the player feel like they have more control over the game. Now, I'm not hoping the drone hits a button or breaks a pane of glass. I am ensuring it does what I want because I am controlling it. And that's the last time the drone plays a role in the game, and I like it. The drone serves its purpose and doesn't feel like it hinders the player anymore. The next gameplay critique is the flow of the game. Did Ban Ban 7 feel like a naturally progressing experience, or were the Euphoric Brothers trying to add more runtime to their game? To my surprise, they improved the game's flow and perfected it for a Garden of Ban Ban game. However, I need to take you through some other Ban Ban games to highlight the drastic improvement. You see, Garden of Ban Ban 3 and 4 struggled with something I will call the light switch phenomena. These two games would have periods of time where it felt like the switch was on, something 
something cool or entertaining happened and you felt engaged with the game. These would be periods of times when you couldn't take your eyes off the screen. Then the light switch would turn off. Suddenly the game would become extremely boring and you would perform some tedious tasks or walk from one side of the map to the other. Here, the player has nothing but background music and their own thoughts. This can be a dangerous thing. We know negative experiences can stand out more than positive ones, which is true for me. My main memories of playing Garten of Band Band 4 are of me walking from one side of the map all the way to the other non-stop. Is that really how the game plays? No, things happen in between, but that's not what comes to mind first. And to those wondering why I haven't mentioned Garden of Band Band 6, I genuinely hate that game. I have nothing positive to say about it, so I will pretend the game doesn't exist. Skipping ahead to Garden of Band Band 7, the light switch phenomena is barely applicable. The Euphoric Brothers decided to set the majority of the game in a little city called City Engine. Sig I have no idea if I'm pronouncing that right, but Chapter 7 is built around the player going to different parts of the city and events happening. For example, the player has to go to a bar where you meet Sheriff Toadster. After this, you have to meet someone who has info about Jumbo Josh, but not before you do them a favor. This favor turns into an encounter with a jester, but Toadster accidentally kills him. I could keep going on, but the point is that the player has to move to new areas within this mini city continuously. You aren't going from one point to another and then back to the original point. You're experiencing new things within a finite area. So Garden of Band Band 7 shows me that the Euphoric Brothers learned from the criticism and drastically improved the game's flow. The next part of the game I want to go over quickly is voice acting. The Euphoric Brothers, or real voice actors, voice this game's important and recurring characters. Characters. But the Euphoric Brothers made a super smart move, having popular YouTubers voice the non-important characters. These quick and entertaining cameos are fun pieces of the game, and it's always fun to recognize which character has the voice of a certain content creator. These cameos are an improvement from the second chapter, and I hope to see them continue. Moving on, it's time to talk about the puzzles. The first puzzle you encounter in this game is super straightforward. You're just setting up a trap to blow up the spider nab nab. After this, there isn't a true puzzle for a while. It really just depends on whether a fetch quest is a puzzle to you. The next puzzle you see is a creepy classroom with our old friend Bambolina. Here you have to match the defining features of characters with their customized circle. This puzzle is unique. It's testing your knowledge of the Band Band characters and I think it's fun. The moment's suspense can make things stressful which is exactly what the Euphoric Brothers should aim for. The next puzzle is the exact opposite. This puzzle requires the player to match the character on the screen with a button on the floor. If you need an example of a bad puzzle, this is it. But things become interesting when the puzzle glitches out and you get attacked by a naughty one. For clarification, a naughty one is this screaming thing that chases you. Are you for real? Oh god, I was gonna say. I was going to say. Oh god, alright. Oh my god, what the heck? What is that thing, bro? What is that? It's like a freaking baby! While this thing is chasing you in the dark, you must direct the drone to hit the red buttons. While I think the earlier puzzle sucks, this is a great twist. But I hesitate to praise the Euphoric Brothers because they give you the same puzzle again. And I think Daco's reaction sums it up best. Don't tell me I've got to do this again. Oh my god. Yes, come on. After this, you get a drone puzzle. This puzzle is the perfect usage of the drone in Garden of Band Band. I can't talk about it enough. You look at the drone and get shown a map of how to get across, pressing each button correctly. You get this final puzzle and a great one to end it with. So it's with semi-confidence that I say the puzzles have improved from Garden of Band Band 2 to 7. The tedious floor circle match puzzle I mentioned earlier is the only thing that concerns me. That is an example of the Euphoric Brothers not learning a thing. It's extremely boring and repeats itself into oblivion. The first iteration is fine, as it sets up the intense moment where the creature breaks into the room. The second time the player runs into it, it's pushing it. But reviewing everything from a gameplay standpoint, things have definitely improved from the second to the seventh game. Unfortunately, while the gameplay has improved, it's time to talk about the storytelling. Garden of Banpan has always had a weird story. In fact, I'm gonna do something that will probably piss off 99% of the people still watching this video. I will compare the story of Five Nights at Freddy's to Garden of Banpan. These franchises tell a story that expands in two ways simultaneously. An example of FNAF doing this is in Five Nights at Freddy's 3. FNAF 3 takes place in the future, but many games depict events that occurred decades ago. Now look at Garden of Ban Ban. We know that our character is searching the kindergarten for their child, and crazy things develop and continue to happen as we dive deeper. Simultaneously, we are learning about the origins and history of the Ban Ban characters and their creation. I'm not saying the storytelling in Garden of Ban Ban is better than FNAF, and I'm just pointing out a similarity. Garden of Ban Ban 2 didn't tell much of a story. It gave hints about what was happening, but didn't give players and theorists much to work with. In 
contrast, Garden of Ban Ban 3 gave us a lot more information. We meet Stinger Flynn and learn about Ban Ban's pancreas-obsessed personality. This chapter received much more praise for its storytelling because we felt like something was happening. Ban Ban was given more depth as a character because he had ulterior motives and Stinger Flynn is trying to stop our parent from saving their child. Speaking of Stinger Flynn, he has to be one of the worst characters ever. I don't know why, and I won't pretend to know why, but he makes no sense as a character. Sadly, I don't think the Euphoric Brothers know what they want to do with Stinger Flynn. From the third game to the seventh, he's constantly giving some of the- Actually, you know what? Euphoric Brothers, if you're seeing this, just skip ahead. I'm going to give a harsh personal take here. I hate Stinger Flynn. There has never been a single moment that I have enjoyed with him talking. As a matter of fact, the only parts that I have enjoyed with him present are when Choo Choo Charles appears and when we jump out of this plane like it's Fortnite. Guys. Oh my god! Oh my god, Fortnite Battle Pass! We're landing! He has not made sense since his first appearance. He's constantly showing useless dream sequences, and his dialogue is some of the most insufferable stuff ever. I know one of the Euphoric Brothers voices him, and it would probably hurt their feelings to say what I am about to say. But please, kill this thing and never let him appear again. I don't care if Ban Ban pulls a Glock out of his back pocket and shoots this jellyfish or runs him over with a Ford F-150. Seriously, anything to get rid of this pain in my brain. Aside from that, the storytelling in Ban Ban has gone through phases. The first phase is Stinger Flynn being the main threat as to why we can't save the children. Then things become complicated. We meet Sheriff Toadster and Queen Bouncilia and learn about the naughty ones she keeps hidden in her pouch. The new main threat becomes Bitter Giggle, a rejected jester who only wants to make the queen laugh with one of his jokes. At the end of chapter 4, he gets her to laugh, and chaos ensues. From this point onward, even into the 7th game, the story becomes less about the children and more about this new villain, Sir Dadadu. I wish I were joking, but that is his real name. So, is this new story arc bad? No, certainly not. The Euphoric Brothers are making a smart pivot into what makes this franchise interesting. Everyone except our main character and Stinger Flynn. The last one might be personal. Bias. Ban Ban, the Surgeon, Sheriff Toadster, and Sir Dada Dude make these games interesting. They have their own developing personalities, personal agendas, and unknown history that we learn more about as we play these games. For that reason, the Euphoric Brothers have to balance our character's goals and agenda within the overall story of Garden of Ban Ban. So while the story has improved and developed from Garden of Ban Ban 1 to 7, there have been some jellyfish shaped bumps in the road. So do we think Garden of Ban Ban has proved anything? Whether it's game, quality, or storytelling, do we believe they're heading in the right direction? To help you make the decision, here Here's the facts. The Euphoric Brothers are doing everything right in terms of growing their franchise. They're getting content creators to upload and talk about their game, making mobile boards for the game, and even having Roblox versions made. The only thing they're missing at this point is a console port. That would be useless because most of their fan base enjoys everything through an iPad and the Roblox maps are probably enough. But my take is that if they continue to innovate and put more money and effort into the games, they will grow and see the success they desire.